Well, good morning, Connect. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Chris. Get to serve as the pastor on the team here. I'm thrilled that you decided to come and worship and grow with us this 4th of July weekend. And I'm excited that you're with us because we're kicking off a season as a church. We've done this in the past. We'll do it again in the future. We call it 21 Days of Prayer. And most of us pray at least some point during the week. Uh, Statistically speaking, a study was done, and about three out of five adults in our country pray at least once during the week. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that in a room like this, we're probably on the higher end of that. Maybe even more than three out of five of us are praying on any given week. Maybe you have a a pretty regular rhythm to your prayer life. Maybe it's... uh, When you get up in the morning, you grab a cup of coffee, you sit down in your favorite chair, you enjoy some Bible reading and prayer to kick off your day. Or maybe you pray with your family before meals. Maybe you pray before you go to bed at night. Maybe maybe you like to be a little more spontaneous in your prayers. So you're praying uh, when you receive the news, you like to thank God for that or, or talk to him about it. Maybe you are quick to ask God for things throughout your day. Maybe your prayer uh, sounds a a bit like a 911 call when you receive the news. Maybe you pray when you really, really need God to show up. Like, God, would you please clear the traffic so I can get there on time? I don't know what your prayer life looks like. Maybe it's, God, I, could you provide, like, we, we need to be able to eat this month. I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but we all want to be people of prayer, at least if we want to have a relationship with God. Like, we, we, we know we're supposed to pray, but, but take a moment and, and just reflect, like, how's your prayer life? Is it, is it fresh and dynamic? Like, when you pray, you just sense God right there with you. Or does prayer kind of feel like blah. You once were excited for prayer, but now God seems a little distant. You're not really sure if he's hearing you. Are they just, are your prayer's bouncing off the ceiling. Or, or maybe does prayer feel rote and religious? You do it because you know you're supposed to, but you wonder to yourself, is this working? Like, is he hearing me? How, how's your prayer life? Uh, recently, I was thinking about this, and I had a kind of a, a rude awakening to the state of my prayer life, and I want to share it with you. You see, uh, I've always kind of had a rhythm, a routine to my prayer, and, and I was doing all the things I normally do. I was praying at the same times of the day that I normally pray, uh, and one of those times is before dinner with our family. And I uh, was sitting, I you know, often would lead our, our family in a prayer before the meal, but on this particular night, I thought, you know what? It's time. We've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old girl. We also got a one-year-old. Uh, but I was like, let me open it up. Would either of you girls like to pray for us? And I can't remember which one offered to pray, but they both have prayed this exact same prayer verbatim many, many times since. And we all bowed our heads, and the girl started, Dear God, thank you for this food. Please give us strength and energy and heal daddy's shoulder and neck. Amen. Amen. Amanda, very graciously, after the prayer, looked at me and said, I guess we know what we pray for a lot. (laughs) I guess so. My, my, uh, My prayer life had become pretty mundane, pretty monotonous. That routine, that rhythm had become a rut. So much so that my three and five year old daughters picked up on it. Now, this isn't a great realization, like a a monotonous, mundane prayer life. Not a great realization as a pastor. Even worse realization as a follower of Jesus. Because here's the deal. I remember times in my life where I have been eager to pray, where I've sensed God's presence in prayer, where I feel like I've heard God speak to me through his word in times of prayer. I've been challenged to pray big, bold, specific prayers. And I've seen God answer those prayers. And because I've seen God show up, I've prayed bigger. I've prayed bolder. I've prayed even more specifically because I wanted to see God move again. 
I know what it feels like to have a fresh and dynamic prayer life. And yet, recently I found myself in a rut where my prayers were mundane and monotonous. Now, this isn't the first time my prayer life has taken a bit of a dip. And you know what? It's not going to be the last either. Because I've been following Jesus for a couple decades now, and what I've observed is that just like our relationship with Jesus, our prayer life is a journey. They're both a journey. And there are going to be some high highs, and there are going to be some lows, and there's going to be some other... That's just how it goes. That's how relationships go. And prayer is very simply God's standing invitation for us to engage with him throughout our day, to have a conversation with him. And while um, God is unchanging, he is, he is unchanging, he's also dynamic, he's relational, he loves to engage with us. We, on the other hand, we're all over the map. Like we're hot and then we're cold, we're in and then we're out, we're up and we're down, we're all over the place. And yet, prayer is this invitation, very practical invitation to relate with God throughout our day. We often don't, though. We like pass on prayer because we don't know what to pray. What do you pray when life is good? What do you pray when life's bad? That's what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks because we want to grow in our relationship with God. I want to grow in my relationship with God. You showed up here. I'm going to say there's at least a little bit of you that wants to grow in a relationship with God. In one of the ways we very practically relate with God is through prayer. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how we pray and how we can grow in prayer and how if our prayer life has become a little dull, it could be refreshed. And more than our prayer life, that our relationship with God could feel a little more dynamic, a little more engaging. Now, to guide us on this journey, we're going to look to and we're going to learn from the book of Psalms. Uh, People have prayed these prayers that are written down. We know them as Psalms. They have prayed these prayers for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years. And we can pray these Psalms as prayers too. So, Psalms is going to be our guide to a more dynamic prayer life. And in so doing, we're going to grow in our relationship with God together. Now, at the outset, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Psalm 1 today, and we're going to look at what our posture should be when it comes to prayer. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to Psalm 1. Psalms is roughly in the middle of your Bible. If you've got a, an app, whether it's our app or another, you can turn there as well. Now, if it is our app, let me say this on the, at the outset. You're going to find other resources, I'll talk about these later in the message, but other resources to support you, to encourage you through this 21 days of prayer. But for now, if you're new to the book of Psalms or you haven't read Psalms recently, let me give you a little bit of the the backstory on what we're about to look at and what we're going to use to guide us in prayer. You see, Psalms was written by a bunch of different people. And they're prayers, they're poetic prayers that God's people have prayed individually and they've prayed corporately back to God throughout the ages. Many of the Psalms were written by King David, but others wrote Psalms as well. And the cool thing about Psalms is that it captures the gamut of human emotion from celebration to trial, pursuit, despair, all of it. Psalms got it. He's got, Psalms has you covered if you ever wonder what to pray. And Psalms is a, making Psalms, excuse me, making Psalms a great go-to prayer guide. And why God's people have prayed these prayers for so long. Because God can handle the whirlwind of our emotions. We're going to see this throughout this series and throughout this, this season of 21 days of prayer. Now, the cool thing about Psalms, you don't have to read it sequentially. You don't have to read like Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 all the way up to 150. You can, but you don't have to. We are going to start with Psalm 1, though, because this psalm is like an introduction. It sets the stage for this whole book. And it's going to set the stage for our next 21 days. So let's do this. Let's pause. Let's pray. And let's just ask that we would grow in prayer through this time, and then we'll read Psalm 1 together. Lord, Thank you for your word. Thank you that it guides us, that it speaks to us, and that um, it even helps us talk and relate with you. 
So even in this moment, would you speak now? Would you speak through your word? Would you speak through me? And God, would we grow in our relationship with you? Would you grow each one of us in prayer, whether we're new to prayer or we've been praying for decades? Would we, over the next 21 days, grow in prayer and grow in our relationship with you? In Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm 1 is, is kind of unique in that it's called a wisdom psalm. And like the book of Proverbs or other wisdom literature in Scripture, uh, two types of people are contrasted against one another. We, we have the wicked on one hand, people who don't know God and don't follow the way of God. And then we've got the righteous, those who do know God, those who go the way of God. And these two are going to be contrasted to reveal the kind of posture that you and I want when it comes to prayer. So let's just read the whole thing. It's a short psalm. Let's read the whole thing, and then we'll break it down. Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We all want happiness. We all want happiness. And Psalm 1 reveals the way to a happy life. Verse 1 begins, blessed is the one. That word translated blessed, it was originally written in Hebrew, and the word there connotes someone who's privileged, someone who's happy. So essentially, Psalm 1 could open, happy is the one. Happy is the one. This should catch our attention because we're all pursuing happiness in one way or another. Maybe we hurry to wrap up things at work so we can get home and enjoy a meal with our loved ones. Uh, maybe, not in our best moments, but maybe we rush through bedtime with our kids because we really want to watch the next episode. Uh, maybe it's taking the express toll because we'd rather spend time in the mountains than in the car and we want to get there as fast as possible and make all the memories we can. I don't know what happiness looks like for you, but all of us want happiness. Like We all want a happy life. And here, we get to see how we can experience a happy life. Blessed, happy is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. It's interesting. One's happiness is directly connected with who one does or does not spend time with. Like, like who you spend time with actually shapes you. Uh, it's been said, show me your five closest friends and I'll tell you who you're going to be in five years. Here, we see, we've got to pause and reflect. We've got to consider who we're spending time with because who we spend time with shapes us. Uh, these days, we aren't just shaped by those we physically spend time with either. Whether it's a podcast we listen to, a news source that we just scroll through endlessly. We can engage with people digitally in their content digitally, and that's great, and the same principle applies. Whatever we're stewing in is shaping us. So we've got to consider, where are we spending our time? How are you spending your time? Like, and is it shaping us into someone who's happy? Uh, is it Joe Rogan? Is it Tim Ferriss? Is it Jordan Peterson? Fox News, CNN, who, who gets most of the airtime for you? Who are you listening to? Who are you learning from? Because if, if that person or in what they're teaching sounds good, yet is not of God, ultimately, it's not worth it. Because as we read in the psalm, the, the way of the wicked, the way of the world, the way that sinners take ultimately leads to to destruction. And that's not the path we want. we want. We want the path for the happy life. So, if we find ourselves 
mulling over and, and thinking about something that's not producing happiness, we've got to dissociate from, we've got to disconnect from that and instead connect closer with God. This is what we see. If you want a happy life, God's got to be our closest connection. His voice has got to be the loudest voice in our life. God's way is the way that we go. I'm not just making this stuff up. If we continue, I'll reread verse 1, but we're going to continue into verse 2 and see how that same principle, who you're with, shapes you. It carries over, both negatively and positively. Check this out. Verse 1 and 2. Blessed, happy is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mocker, mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Happy is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Okay, I delight in a lot of things. I delight in encouragement from my wife, Amanda. I delight in pool days with our girls. I delight in making memories in the mountains. But do I delight in God's word? I, I want that to be more true of me tomorrow than it was yesterday. I want to be someone who delights in God's word. Because uh, literally, the, the law of the Lord is God's word. The, the law, as it's in this passage, it refers to the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, known as the Torah. It's in the first five books of our Bible, and it teaches some really fundamental things like, who is God? Who are we? How do we relate with God? And we can learn a lot about those things by reading the first five books of the Bible. And the rest of the Bible tells the rest of the story of how God loves us deeply and he wants a relationship with us. So he sent Jesus to make that possible. And now, if, if we know Jesus and we follow him, his spirit is in us, encouraging us, helping us to pray, even when we don't know what to pray. Uh, back then, when, when the psalmist wrote this, back then, people, most people couldn't read. So they would meditate when that but more than just meditate it with this idea was mutter like like as they're pondering it they're just they're rehearsing it kind of under their breath they're they're meditating on it they're reflecting on the passage because they can't just like read they're having to recite it and has anyone done like a Bible reading plan or something like that? Could be in the YouVersion Bible app, could be like old-fashioned book style. Uh, however, I, I love Bible reading plans. One of my personal favorites is to read through the whole Bible in a year because I find myself reading stuff I just wouldn't normally read. Now, here's what typically happens when I do something like the Bible in a year reading plan. I start off really strong. I can't wait. I'm excited. This is going to be the year. And, and I have a, a decent start, maybe for a few days, maybe a week. And then what happens is I, I start to putter out a little bit. Maybe uh, the girls got up a little sooner than I was anticipating, so I didn't quite complete the reading for the day. And then the next day I'm like playing catch up. And before long, what happens is the Bible reading plan becomes like a box to be checked instead of a relationship that I'm pursuing. I, I wonder, though, like what if... What if instead of reading scripture to try to get through scripture, what if we read scripture for it to get through us, to change us, to transform us? This is about a relationship with God, a God who loves us deeply, a God who wants the best for us. And yet, sometimes I rush through the process instead of embrace the journey. Because that's what a relationship is, after all. It's a journey. It's got highs. It's got lows. And prayer is God's standing invitation to us to not just connect with him when we're reading our Bible, though that's a really good place to start. It's his invitation to connect throughout the day. Uh, the posture of prayer that's portrayed in this psalm is that the happy person is the one who actually lets God speak first, and then we respond and engage with him thereafter. Happy is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Happy is the one who meditates on his law day and night. Day and night. Uh, that's a, a literary term called a marismus. Basically, uh, two extremes are posed, day and night, or like in Genesis 1-1, we got the heaven, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Like two extremes are posed. And the idea is, 
is to capture everything in between. So God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything. Or in the case of this passage, all right, we're supposed to meditate day and night, a.k.a. all the time. Now, that principle isn't just an Old Testament principle. Uh, the New Testament picks up on this. Uh, Paul even wrote this, an early follower of Jesus, one of the, probably the greatest missionary, Christian missionary the world's ever known. Uh, Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually. Okay, that sounds awesome, but can I be honest with you? As a guy, I just don't have that much to say. But I wonder, I wonder if that's because we've actually defined prayer too narrowly. Prayer is not less than talking to God, but I think Scripture poses that prayer is so much more than talking to God. It's actually a posture in which we live our life. And it's not just us talking to God, it's us hearing from Him and relating with Him through it all, through all that life throws our way. Uh, Psalms 1 it, Psalm 1 is the introduction to the, to the book of prayer for God's people throughout the ages. And it's so interesting. The word prayer is not mentioned anywhere in this psalm. Yet the posture is painted that this person, the one who has a prayerful posture, lets God speak first and reflects on, meditates on, slowly mulls over God's word. Because the, the goal isn't a plan to be achieved. The goal is a relationship that's pursued. God pursued us, and now we get to reciprocate and engage with him through prayer. And communication with God is key to connection with God. Our goal is not a destination where God answers all, every request. The, the goal isn't that at all. The, the goal is the relationship. It's the transformation, the change that we experience in the time spent with him, because the time spent with him will shape us change us. So this is the invitation of God to us in Psalm 1. And if we accept this invitation to live with a posture of prayer, to meditate, mull over God's word, then listen to what we get to expect. Verse 3, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So there's a, there's a ditch right behind our house, okay? Now this ditch, 95% of the time, bone dry. I mean, it is, there's nothing happen in there. It is so dry, and that's great news if you want to cross from one side of the neighborhood to the other side of the neighborhood. Neighborhood kids do it all the time. And yet, when that crazy storm came through last week, that ditch went from bone dry to completely flooded. I mean, check this out. This is a picture from our backyard. This got as close as I am comfortable to our fence. It was right there. More water than we've ever seen. Felt like we just upgraded. We now have waterfront property. <laughs> and, and in minutes, this just happened. And it was like, whoa. And as quickly as that filled up, the ditch dried up. And there's this tree in the ditch. You can flip to the next slide of this tree. Now, my wife and I have a debate going on. That stuff that's wrapped around this measly tree, is that its roots or is that the, like, ditch grass? I think it's ditch grass, but, you know, I'm not going to make you vote because that's going to make someone feel bad. But, record, on record, I think it's the ditch grass. But, I mean, look at this. I feel bad for this tree. I mean, most of the time it gets, like, zero water. I'm not, I'm not watering it. My neighbors aren't watering it. And apparently God's not watering it much either because this ditch is bone dry. And yet, then it gets flooded and it's halfway up the tree and now the tree is like wrapped with stuff. Similar to the ditch in my backyard. In the ancient Near East, and probably still in the Near East today, there are these things called wadis. And in a, in a wadi, uh, they, <laughs> they were dry like most of the time. So a tree living there doesn't do well. The only time wadis had water was when there was a spring runoff or a flash flood, kind of like we just experienced. And a tree won't live well next to a wadi. It doesn't grow big and strong because the water source is inconsistent. 
I, I contrast, you know, what I see in my backyard and what uh, would have been like in you know, a tree trying to grow in the wadis with what I see when I go on a bike ride with my family. When we bike along the Cherry Creek Trail, we'll pass these huge cottonwood trees. They're big, they're strong. I went by there just this past week to take a look, like how did these trees fare after the, the storm? Nothing changed. They look the exact same, just as strong, just as hardy. They're doing great because they're right next to a consistent water source. And it has all the water that it needs. So here's the question for us. Do you want a, a life that can withstand the storms of life? Do you want a life that can withstand all the different seasons and weather patterns? Because here's the deal. Life in a broken world that's plagued by sin, it's a lot like the weather in Colorado. It is sunny one minute and it is hailing the next. So do you want a life that can weather the storms of life? If you do, it starts with your prayer life. So how close are you with God? How consistently are you in his word? Regularly? Or 95% of the time are you not? Are you in regular, constant conversation with him? Or is God like a 911 call for you? Life happens. It happens. And whether we're planted in a dry ditch, like the tree in my backyard, or we're like a cottonwood tree planted next to the Cherry Creek Trail. It's, it has to do with whether, where we're planted. Are we planted by streams of water? Are we, are we rooted into God's word? Are we closely connected with him? Or are we listening to other people, things, the ways of the world? Prayer is the posture of one who's planted by streams of water. The end of verse 3, it says, and whatever they do prospers. As Americans, we would love to read the American dream into this. That like, if we are close with God, what that means, we, we would hope that it means, oh, we're going to be healthy, we're going to be wealthy, it's all going to go well all the time. And some people will tell you that. It's just not biblical. It's also not our experience, is it? Even when we follow Jesus, we still experience the highs and the lows. We experience all the same things everyone else experiences. The difference is we're rooted in a consistent life source. We're, we're, we're planted by streams of water. We're closely connected with God. And that gives us the strength to weather the storms of life. Because the storms are going to come. Sunny days are going to come too. And we're going to talk about later in this series... What do we do? How do we pray on the sunny days and on the stormy days? When life is good and when life is bad, what can we pray? Because we want to be a people who don't just pray sometime. We want to be a people who live with a posture of prayer. And we can actually be joyful amidst the storm because we know we're going to make it through the storm. We, we, we know we have a God who's on our side, who is above all, who's going to see us through it all. That's what we know. Now, God's presence with us and our awareness of him is a gift. It's a gift. But not everyone's received it. And the psalmist tells us what's going to happen to the wicked, those who don't know God, those who don't follow him, those who aren't closely connected with him, tells us their fate as well. Verse 4 through 6, not so the wicked. They're not like the tree planted by streams of water. Oh, no, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. In contrast to the righteous who know God, who know his word, they're rooted in it, they have a relationship with it. In contrast to the righteous, the, the wicked don't. And ultimately, they fade away. The choice is yours. Life and vitality or, or death and destruction, the choice is yours. And it has to do with where you're planted. Do you have a relationship with God? Are you engaging with him in that relationship? Or is God an afterthought? 
Are, are other voices the loudest voices in your life? And are you being shaped by that rather than being shaped by your creator? Just remember, who you spend time with shapes you. And where you're planted impacts your life. It impacts whether you're going to be able to withstand the storms when they come. And how you live life now, well, it's going to look a lot like where you spend eternity forever, whether it's with God or without God. The choice is ours. So let's be a people who lean in to prayer. Not because prayer saves us, Jesus saves us. Jesus is the one who makes it possible to have a relationship with God, a conversation with God. And over the next 21 days, let's lean into prayer really intentionally so that together we can grow, we can strengthen, we can encourage one another. And together we can become a little better prayers, a little more closely connected with God. One of the ways that we want to do this is making the most of our time with God each day. We call it chair time. Uh, Everyone it looks different for, but for me, I just have a, a spot on the couch where I pretty much only ever sit there when I'm reading my Bible and praying. It helps me kind of focus. Otherwise, I'm always, my mind's running in different directions, etc. But I just, you know, in the morning, I sit down, I read my Bible, and I, I journal to pray. And that's a great routine, but like I shared, it, it had become a prayer rut. So here's the challenge to all of us. Let's mix up whatever that time looks like for you. Let's kind of mix it up a bit or start doing it for the first time. And following Jesus is just way better together. So let's do this together. We have a a guide for the next 21 days. Alex helped put this together for us, did a great job. And we're going to try to approach scripture differently than how most of us probably read scripture on a regular basis. What we most, what most of us probably do, because we live in the West, is we love, when we read scripture, we love to study scripture. Like, I want to learn about God. I want to know him. Like, we want to we study scripture. And there, there's nothing wrong with studying scripture. Studying scripture is great. I got degrees in studying scripture. I love studying scripture. It's just not the only way to approach God's word. There's another way to approach God's word. It's like turning the jewel a bit and looking at his word from a different angle. Christians have been doing this throughout the ages. It's called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina, it's Latin for divine reading. Whereas we're typically approaching God's word like it's a textbook, something to be studied. Lectio Divina views God's word differently. It views God's word as his word, his living word to us. Like we could actually hear from God through his word. And instead of focusing on trying to get through scripture to acquire some amount of knowledge, we we slow down. And Lectio Divina is about getting God's word through us. You see, instead of reading a ton, Lectio Divina is about reflecting more. So you might actually read less, but you're, you're pondering it, you're thinking about it, you're meditating on it. It's more about connection with God than information about God. So here's what we're going to do. Instead of rushing through this Bible reading plan, what we're going to do is we're going to approach it with a little bit more of an open-handed posture. And if we don't, if we miss a day, we miss a day. God's still there and he wants to engage us tomorrow. So we're just going to, we're going to be on this journey together And instead of trying to accomplish something, we're just going to enjoy being in his presence. We're going to learn to to pray with different postures. If you looked at the plan for today, all of this is in the app, by the way. So you can just, you can easily access it all for free right there. The the plan today has you sit and pray with your hands uh, open-handed like this. Some of you maybe have prayed like this before. Some of you probably haven't, and that's okay. It's good to mix it up because our physical posture actually impacts how we are engaging with God in the moment. So let's try it. Let's try it together. Let's, for the next 21 days, let God's word inspire our prayers. You can still talk to him about all the other things, but let's let God's word speak to us first and then let our prayer be our response to him. And let's, let's try to read a little bit less and reflect a little bit more and just see what God has to say. All the details are in that, both for the the prayer guide, the 21 days of prayer guide, and 
next week, not this week, because this Tuesday, we got 4th of July, pretty big deal. Next Tuesday, July 11th, we're going to do a worship and prayer night. And we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. Because we're just, we're, we're leaning in to prayer in this season together. Both individually and also corporately. Just like the book of Psalms has guided God's people throughout the ages. And here's, here's what we're going to expect on the tail end. Like three weeks from now, here's what I expect to, that we will have experienced. Because here's what we've learned today. We know it's going to be a good experience. It's going to be challenging. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I believe it's going to be good. We are going to be better for, the, for having gone on the journey for the next 21 days because of what we read in Psalm 1. And here's what we saw. Happy is the one planted in the presence of God. So pray to prosper. All right, let's pray. God, we would ask that that very thing would be so true of us, both in this 21 days and beyond. Lord, we just, we want to lean in intentionally and we want to see you show up. Would you inspire our conversations with you? Would you draw us closer to you? Thank you that your word promises in James 4, 8, that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And thank you for the invitation of Psalm 1 to draw near to you, to be, to be planted in your presence. So, Holy Spirit, would you work in us in that way? And would we see you show up? Would we experience you in a fresh way? Would you refresh our prayer life? Would you refresh our relationship with you? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.